Okay, well, let's get underway. I'm sure that uh, this is going to be a, a, a very stimulating session, and I'm absolutely delighted to have been asked to chair it. And the procedure we've agreed on is that I will first introduce our distinguished speaker, Alec Roy. Uh, he will then speak, and I will then introduce our second distinguished speaker, Priya Cheko, and she will speak, and then we have, we hope, time for a discussion. And I should tell you that I'm going to use my introductions to our two speakers as a way of making some provocative comments about the nature of the political. And I might add that uh, Amitabh has given me permission to do this as of our two speakers. Well, as most of you would be aware, Alec Rye has uh, a background in literature. That's where he came from. And as you'd also probably be aware, it was in the family blood. His grandfather, Prem Chan, is, of course, a literary luminary. His father was also a writer. And then when he went to university, at, Sorry. when he went to university at Ahmedabad, he uh, did uh, his undergraduate and his MA, I think, in literature. And then as a Rhodes Scholar, scholar he went on to Oxford and to Magdalen College. And again, uh, he took <coughs> literature for his B. Phil. His thesis was, in fact, on George Orwell. And then as his career developed, that's not a very nice way of putting it, but anyway, we haven't got time to reformulate it. And as he got various appointments, uh, he moved to, uh, I think, the Indian Institute of Technology in, uh, in Delhi, then to the Nehru uh, uh, Memorial uh, Museum and Library, uh, to uh, the University of Delhi, and so on. It seems, at least to me, uh, that his outlook, his approach broadened out, that he used literature more and more uh, to uh, open up uh, the, the political and the, and, and the cultural, which has led to his recent work, uh, remarkable work, with respect to uh, literature, language, diversity, and so on, that he's going to speak uh, about tonight. And I would like to think that uh, that thesis on George Orwell and working with that literary background might have played a part in opening his eyes to a different kind of politics. And I immediately think, as you would think, of, uh, I, I can't waste too much time, but of that short story, Shooting an Elephant, and how profoundly important it is political. But it's about the kind of politics that, for the most part, I would suggest, is not taken up in departments of politics or international relations. And I would go further and say that in my own area, international politics, uh, that in many ways the most imaginative contributions to rethinking have come either from novelists, people like Amitav Ghosh, uh, the Bengali novelist, or from literary theorists, most notably uh, Edward Said. And I want to conclude my introduction with one small vignette. Uh, the day before this conference opened in the afternoon of Wednesday, I had a long conversation on the telephone with my um, dear friend Ashish Nandi, who is a distinguished fellow of the Institute of Postcolonial Studies. And he knew, of course, about this conference. And I just happened to mention that uh, we had a panel on... Uh, uh, on, um, I've forgotten exactly the title of it, but anyway, uh, <laughs> we had this panel, and that, uh, <laughs> I looked with, and I said, you don't happen to know this chap, do you? And he said, but Philip is a very dear friend. And he went on to say how much he loved this friend and how much he admired his intellectual work. And I won't embarrass our speaker by repeating it, and we don't have the time. But I want to make, uh, I want to be just a little cheeky and uh, tell you what she said to conclude that part of the conversation. And he said, uh, 
One thing you can be sure about, Philip, is a lot will have interesting and important things to say. He is quite comfortable straying from the straight and the narrow. <laughs> Hello. Mr. Chairman, um, friends, um, <clears throat> it has, of course, uh, become something of a ritual, but it's not only in the spirit of ritual that I wish to thank uh, the Australia India Institute for uh, inviting me here and for inviting me as part of this wonderfully diverse group. I would uh, like to I warn or assure, I'm not quite sure what the word is, that I must unmistakably be a part of the diversity that have been assembled here. Um, I have been, I'm very happy to be here, but I've been inhabiting a sort of, um, how should I put it, a kind of magical universe the last two days, which, uh, in which, uh, as it were, there are large entities that are the agents of social and historical process. There are, there are states and nations that want, they desire, they, they, they seek, and things like that. And uh, since my own engagement with uh, sort of social process is uh, some rather below that large abstract level, I, you know, I'm, you know, I like to think, I like to think in terms of uh, people and how they relate with the world and you know and what they think and so on. So it's this. This is in fact, I, I have been able to formulate to myself my sense of wonder at the kind of things I was doing and how wonderfully different it was from what I was planning to do here. Um, I was asked, broadly speaking, to talk about uh, India's language diversity and policies and things like that. And India's linguistic diversity is like everything else about India, full of big numbers. So no matter where one starts with India, you know, this is uh, <laughs> Grierson's Linguistic Survey of India, early 20th century, 364 languages and dialects. Uh, the uh, people of India uh, survey done by Kumar Suresh Singh, uh, which was initiated in 1985 and published in, naturally, 43 volumes, had talked about 325 languages divided into five language families and using 25 scripts and so on. You know, uh, yet another census, 1991, 1,576 1, mother tongues, which is fair enough. Why not? But in addition to 1,576 mother tongues, there were 1,796, 1,796 things that were under the category other mother tongues, which of course left me <laughs> completely baffled. I have no idea what other mother tongues are. <laughs> However, as a consequence of this, obviously, um, Language and linguistic assertion has, always, has been a very important part of, uh, of the process of nation formation in India. And uh, as anyone who knows anything about intimacy knows, the fact that language and nation formation have been intimately connected does not mean that it has been an easy relationship. It's been an intimate, but often a very difficult relationship. And obviously, this, these, these intimate uh, um, workings of nation and, and language can be thought of in, at various different levels, but I'm not going to try and race through an 8,000 word paper in 20 minutes, so I'm, not, I'm going to skip much of that, and what I'm trying to do here is to actually try and address the larger question through the way in which English has functioned and continues to function in our national life. Um, once again, English, the question of English is intimately bound up with Indian nationalism, both with the, with the emergence of Indian nationalism, uh, you know, where um, it is argued indeed that English indeed enables the nation first to be brought to mind, qua nation, in the 19th century. Certainly, um, English also figures very very strongly in the nationalist imagination as the language of the colonial oppressor, so that there is a great, great movement within, within nationalism to reject English 
and uh, then the Constitution of India struggles, uh, that many people have referred to, struggles with uh, uh, the question of English and what, what is to be done with English, so that English is not really one of the languages of the nation, but still ends up being retained at the end of a long, complicated, and fascinating constitutional process as an additional associate official language. And uh, so English is, as far as I'm concerned, an entree into, into the conundrum of India. I mean, it's one way, obviously there are many others, but it's one way of beginning to think about India as a kind of puzzle. And it's, it's unlike the world in which uh, I've been uh, you know, listening to things in the last couple of days. This has to do with, uh, with, uh, with cultural factors and with the way in which, as it were, life is lived the way, it, the way the times are experienced by the people who are living those times, rather than from some high location. There are many phases to this um, engagement with English, and uh, again, I won't take very long, but the first is, the first that I would like to refer to is something that I associate with my um, years as a student in the 1960s when uh, this was the phase of the nationalist rejection of English. This is, uh, uh, th th this, this is the movement that in, in UP was called Angrezi Hatao. All right, English was the language of the colonial oppressor, we would have nothing to do with it, and out with English, black, uh, blackboards were, uh, sorry, uh, sign, sign, signboards were uh, painted over, and uh, so on. You know, that kind of thing went on. And clearly the understanding was that English was in the way. English was standing in the way of the assertion of the languages of India and consequently of the people of India and the way for, for them to come forward was to remove English. So th there was a kind of zero-sum game that was happening. I mention zero-sum game because of course this period of nationalist rejection of English has led in the recent past to the global or globalizing embrace of English. So suddenly English is, uh, is uh, welcome, desired, actively sought, and actively made available. So I was talking to someone and he said, well, you know, what has happened really is, and this, this obviously fits in with the, with the euphoric narrative of globalization, we are in a situation in which, of course, we are at the end of zero-sum games. We have entered a regime of abundance, and therefore there is now no conflict between one and the other. Everybody can thrive, so that you know, so that uh, the, 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 as it were, the big media companies are subtitling their work in Hindi, so Hindi grows, and there's stuff there. On the other hand, there is English, and English is being made available to everyone, and so one has that that expression, beloved of uh, management types, which is called win. -win win. So we have a win-win. There, there is this wonderful euphoric world in which there are no losers. So be it. I was reminded, however, uh, and really grateful for that, of uh, Tolstoy's opening sentence from Anna Karenina about happy families being all alike, that if indeed it was win-win, of course we wouldn't need a conference at all. <laughs> because happy families don't make for good stories. There's not much which can, you can do with happy families. Um, and I'm afraid, at least the way I tell this narrative, uh, it's not quite win-win. I wish it were. I dearly hope I'm wrong. But anyway, let me, let me say what I want to say. Uh, to come back to English and the way English functions, there are, I want to get two, as it were, common misunderstandings out of the way, and these misunderstandings derive one from the phase of the nationalist rejection of English, and the second from the globalizing embrace of English. The first can be summarized briefly as uh, English is not ours, it belongs to them, we have got rid of them, we wish to have nothing more to do with it, simple. The other misunderstanding almost exactly opposite, is, would be a, expressed in a phrase that certainly people who are fresh from India would recognize immediately. English is ours only. <laughs> right? It's, it's ours. And, uh, and you know, and we, we can 
take it and we can do what with it and you know and it's ours and we can possess the world i suspect that both of these positions are untenable english is ours but um, it is ours with a very special kind of historical baggage. It comes as part of a kind of historical conjuncture. And that burden of history which sits on the presence of English in India and its social location in India is not something that can be wished away by any kind of euphoric narrative. I'm afraid it doesn't happen that way. However, to introduce one more player into this story, I'm doing OK for time, am I? Yeah. Sure. yeah, good. One more play into the story, and because they've been talked about uh, this morning as well, this was, uh, so, the young, the, what, is, what is known as the, the, the youth bulge, not, not a very attractive word, but it's <laughs> used constantly, and according to the 2001 census, 60% uh, or more of our population is or will soon be under 30, and this has been spoken of as a kind of youth dividend. Um, that somehow this is, this, this is going to work to our advantage and, uh, and it's this, this large and growing workforce that is going to, going to help us to outstrip China, of course. Um, so now, I just want to enter, I'm, I'm not quite sure about that. I don't understand, I'm not an economist, I don't understand the way these things work, but I am reminded nonetheless of another dividend, which some of us may remember, which was the peace dividend, which was supposed to happen uh, at the end of the Cold War, 1989. And some of us may remember what happened to the peace dividend. It seemed to evaporate somewhere. I don't know at what point the peace dividend was lost, but somehow, the, the bonanza that was supposed to happen at the end of the Cold War when funds were to be available for all good things seems not to have happened. And I dearly wish someone would tell me what happened. But anyway, so uh, as with the peace dividend, I'm a little wary of the youth dividend. However, let me bring the story to English and the way in which this burgeoning market of young people who are entering the job market or hoping to enter the job market more precisely, seeking employment and therefore driving a vast sector which is experiencing explosive growth, which is the English coaching school. The coaching academy so that everywhere all over India, anyone who has a few square feet of space and something that sounds like English to something, some to people who don't know English can make a fortune. <laughs> it's there, and it's there, and it's waiting to be made. Um, I don't want to mock this. I, I, I have actually, as part of the research for this, I've sat in on, on uh, you know, some coach, coaching center classes. And what one sees there is a deeply moving spectacle. These are people who have, who have pooled their limited resources in the hope of acquiring something that is going to make them a part of the modern world. They want it, they want it desperately, and this is something that is going to give them not merely call center employment, that is the least of it. But there's more than that. Beyond that, as it were, there is international access. There is the, there is the glowing world of globalization. Everything waits at the end of that call center diploma. And this is moving. It's decidedly significant. I'm not quite sure what it's significant of, but it is significant. Because it indicates that there is this huge constituency of people who are ready and wanting in both senses, both not having and wishing to have. Uh, this desire is not a kind of passive, neutral kind of wanting. And uh, I want to give a couple of examples Um, the, 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 the title of the paper that I've submitted here is, uh, uh, is in fact, the, was the tagline of an advertising campaign that was run by uh, a, one of the kind of mobile service providers, Uninor, as a matter of fact, 
I don't know whether they're still providing, because, because they were probably caught up in the 2G scam, but never mind. Uh, they ran a very successful, or certainly very visible advertising campaign, and the tagline was, Ab mera number hai. This was this, the advertising campaign figure, you know, had these, these young, young, determined, square-jawed faces, you know, ready, eager, impatient to inherit the future, and the line was simply, it's my turn now. You know, and the message certainly for someone like me was, step aside. It's my turn now, okay? And uh, for instance, again, my town, where I was doing this research, all right, uh, was plastered with, um, uh, again, with, with uh, ad advertisements for a coaching uh, academy called, interestingly enough, Trounce coaching academy. And the, the, again, the tagline was, um, the tagline was, um, forgive me, but I, it, it is essential to get the flavor of contemporary India that Hindi and English are mixed. Ab confidence se baate hongi English mein. All right? So it's English holds the promise of participating in modernity with all its joys. All right? And so it's not merely, it's not merely employment, it's also you know, it's also conviviality, a kind of social mobility, and things. The name, interestingly enough, is Trumps. Now, I, I don't think that the violent uh, uh, associations of Trumps are necessarily intended in the name. I suspect that it might merely be, Trumps may merely be a very emphatic form of winning. You know, that you not merely win, but that you you really, really, really win. I don't know, I suspect, but it's possible that there is, there is something more, that, that, that in this eagerness, there is, if not already an anger, certainly the possibility of an anger, of a kind of rage, a kind of impatience to inherit the world, okay? And it is this, it is this kind of impatience which is really, the, uh, you know, something that I wish to add to the, to, the, to the debate here, add to the consideration here. Because English is merely one manifestation of this desire to be included, inclusive India. So this, the desire to be included is a very real one. The desire is to be included. English holds the promise of inclusion. Okay, and the puzzle, and the slightly complicated puzzle that I want to place before you is that English is simultaneously the possibility of inclusion and the near certainty of a certain kind of exclusion as well. This, the same thing, it is, it is that same, the, the kind of the globish, the coaching center English that you acquire, which you think is the, which one hopes is the, is the passport to modernity and, and, and inclusion in the world, also becomes that which reinforces exclusion, right? So this, this is a slightly complicated argument that I want to put, but this is, for instance, for instance, um, a couple of years back, a Dalit activist had proposed that uh, Chandrabhan Prasad uh, proposed that, that uh, a new goddess was to be added to the pantheon and the goddess was English. Because, because it was in fact through worshiping the divinity English that the hitherto excluded untouchables would gain access. Uh, and I recognize and respect what drives it. What drives that demand, I can see what the subtext of that longing to create a temple to English means. My, my fear, however, is that if by some improbable miracle it were possible for everybody in India, right, with Indian numbers, suddenly to acquire English, to be fluent and you know, transparently uh, you know, possess the language, would we usher in a utopia immediately, or 
would privilege find other forms of reinforcing itself? I rather fear it is the latter, that, that the symbolic triumphs of acquiring English would not translate necessarily into revolution, you know? I mean, to put, to put the question very bluntly, uh, is the avidity of the demand for English a reinforcement of the structure of privilege or is it a challenge to it? I suspect that it is both. I suspect that it is both a challenge to that structure of privilege and a reinforcement of it. And, it's, and to me, the explosive potential of, of English in India at the moment derives precisely from this doubleness, the fact that it is both of these at the same time. Or finally, to bring it back to the revolution in the title, in the phenomenon of this explosive growth of English and the English Coaching Academy, are we seeing the revolution? Or is this the containment of the revolution? Or is it merely the prelude to what Zizek in a recent uh, piece in the, in the London Review of Books calls the zero degree revolution? This is the revolution which is rage, he's talking about uh, he's talking about the English uh, happenings, the, the kind of youth riots of the last few weeks, but it's of a, of a rage which is without focus, of uh, an explosion of resentment, but without any specific demands. So that, so that it, is, it is a lot of people who are unhappy and don't like the world the way the world is, except that there is nothing there's no imagination of what it is that they actually want. So the, the question that I want to raise via English is precisely what, ex what exactly are we preparing for in, in this phenomenon? Anyway, I will, uh, I better stop here. I think I've taken all the time I need to. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Luke. Um, it's been now my pleasure to uh, introduce our second speaker, Priya Chekho. Priya is one of a, of a band of young scholars, some in Australia, some in India, others throughout the world, who are challenging, I think, some of the um, uh, fundamental assumptions of traditional international relations. Uh, I first read her work in, I, I checked it last night, Pierre, in 2004, when she was kind enough to send me a paper she wrote on um, anarchy uh, and the state of nature in international relations theory. And I thought it was simply terrific, first class in every way. And then a couple of years later, I was uh, privileged to be invited to be one of uh, the examiners of her PhD thesis, which was submitted to the University of Adelaide. And part of this, you have an opportunity to read this, because that thesis partly flowed in and shaped up the book that is coming out uh, uh, with Rutledge, I think later this month. Uh, so you can all read it for yourself. But essentially, um, the thesis is about uh, the ambivalence in Indian foreign policy relating to uh, the post-colonial condition. And this is a very fine piece of work. Uh, to my mind, what stood out about the thesis was its imaginative reach. And one of the things it did is that it focused on uh, the performative side of uh, Indian foreign policy when it came. And I thought this was simply terrific. And without going on at length, because we haven't time uh, here, it's not appropriate. Uh, but while I didn't agree with uh, all the things that she wrote, and, uh, and she was very resistant, and uh, probably resistant to some of the things I said, uh, but one of the things she must do, I think, is develop the performative. And I say it publicly to try and force her hand. But what was remarkable about this thesis 
is it made me think afresh. And uh, I think this is also true of uh, the paper that she's going to deliver today. So for me, um, I didn't meet Priya until uh, we've exchanged all this correspondence, but I only met her yesterday morning. So this is a great bonus for me uh, uh, to meet her at this conference. Thank you very much, Amitab. And I found that uh, it was wonderful. I found I enjoyed her company as much as I um, really thought highly of her intellectual work and admired her work. And the only source of regret to, to me is that if she were in Melbourne, she could contribute so much to the life of the Institute of Postcolonial Studies. But there it is, she's in Adelaide. Priya check. Thank you, Philip, for that very generous introduction. I have to say, Philip is a path-breaking scholar in international relations, and I wouldn't have been able to write my book if it hadn't been for his work. Uh, thank you, Professor Matu, for uh, inviting me here today. Now, what I'm talking about today is India-US relations, so I'm going back to the high politics and away from the everyday, unfortunately. The question that I'm looking at in my paper is this. Is India undergoing a revolution in how it sees itself and its place in the world? I try to answer this question by examining India's changing relationship with the United States. And this is because the current improvement in US-India relations has been cited as evidence that Indian foreign policy and India's worldview in general has undergone a radical shift since the 1990s. India is said to be moving away from the third world and towards new partnerships with countries like the US. And this is said to be an indication that India's identity is changing. By taking a closer look at the India-US relationship, I want to examine whether this is actually the case. Now, these are topics that have been touched on by several speakers already, uh, but as you'll see, I'm using a slightly different approach. So, there are three questions I'll be looking at today. Why were India-US relations strained during the Cold War? Why have they improved? And has this recent improvement been so significant that we can conclude that the Indian state has undergone a revolution in how it sees itself and its place in the world. And just a note of clarification, when I say India, I mean the Indian state and its leadership. You can't really confuse national identity with state identity, they're two different things. So let's go to the first question. Why were India-US relations strained during the Cold War? I think the strain in this relationship is difficult to explain from both a strategic perspective and a democratic peace perspective. A democratic peace perspective says that when states share democratic norms and institutions and recognise each other's democratic status, relations between them will be cooperative, or at least non-conflictual. But this theory certainly didn't hold for, India, for, for the India-US relationship. From a strategic perspective, US military assistance to Pakistan from 1954 and India's tilt toward the Soviet Union from 1972 were significant problems. However, it's important to note that relations between India and the US were already strained prior to these developments. While India's policy of non-alignment was an early irritant, officials in both the Truman and Eisenhower administrations generally considered India an important country which was worthy of US support and which could function as a bulwark against communism. Yet a lasting engagement between India and the US never eventuated. And I would contend that this was due to a deeper disconnect. Specifically, a key barrier in the US-India relationship has long been a point of similarity between them. Both countries have identities that are underpinned by the idea that because of their history and character, they possess ex exceptional qualities. According to the narrative of American exceptionalism, democracy, geographical separation from arenas of conflict and multiculturalism set the United States apart from other world powers and therefore it would exercise global leadership in a uniquely moral and benign way. 
According to the narrative of Indian exceptionalism, the restraint, wisdom, resilience and tolerance of India's ancient civilization set India apart from other countries. American exceptionalism underpinned a Cold War foreign policy in which international, international politics was seen as a struggle between good and evil and US leadership was indispensable. In contrast, India's civilizational exceptionalism underpinned a Cold War foreign policy which was shaped by its first Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru, who saw international politics as dominated by a vicious cycle of fear and insecurity, which India could help to ameliorate through policies like non-alignment and disarmament. Now, just incidentally, I think that uh, this psychological approach to international politics of Nehru's uh, was the result of Nehru's attraction to Buddhist thought. And I don't have time to elaborate on that, but it ties into Peter Friedlander's work, which we heard earlier today. Now, within the binary good and evil framework of US foreign policy, policies like non-alignment could only be seen as moral neutrality. And the behaviour of India's leadership was considered mystical, emotional and unpredictable. For the Indian leadership, on the other hand, US foreign policy was considered both misguided and dangerous. In this way, the US and Indian leaderships contributed to each other's sense of ontological insecurity during the Cold War. Now, I borrowed this term, ontological insecurity, from social theorist Anthony Giddens. And he defines it as the sense of being or sense of identity which is necessary for dealing with the existential and cognitive uncertainty. Uh, which is a feature of the human condition. So in other words, we can't predict the future uh, and we aren't born with inherent knowledge of why we exist. So in order to deal with this, individuals create for themselves a biographical narrative which consolidates their place in the world. The modern state often has a role in this process. It's often a provider of ontological security for its citizens, but particularly for the elite. So state officials, I would suggest, are compelled to construct a biographical narrative about their state, which consolidates that state's position in the world. India and the US, I, I would argue, questioned each other's biographical narratives during the Cold War, and this led to the creation of long-term distrust. So this brings us to the question of why relations between the US and India have improved. I would suggest that much of the improvement is due to a re-evaluation of India in US foreign policy and in the US's biographical narrative. As it grapples with the uncertainty associated from moving, between, from moving from a US-dominated transatlantic era to a trans-Pacific era dominated by the rise of Asia and China in particular. These sorts of periods of power transition are times of destabilisation and uncertainty as established relations between states and patterns of hierarchy are revised or challenged. But this sense of insecurity isn't merely linked to material factors. It's also rooted in the ontological insecurity felt by the state elite. Now, Giddens argues that for individuals, one important way to consolidate a biographical narrative is by pursuing forms of social interaction with others that result in the creation of trust. In a similar vein, I would argue that one of the, one of the ways that state agents respond to the destabilisation and uncertainty that comes with power transitions is by seeking out agents of other states in order to create a collective identity which can function as a source of international order. The US-UK's special relationship is one example of this. Um, this was a relationship that came into existence through a deliberate and sustained effort by the British and American leaderships, bureaucracies and publics to create a collective Anglo-American identity, which was a source of stability for both. In the current period of power transition, the US leadership perceives a generalised uncertainty and anxiety about the maintenance of a US-dominated order. Secondly, China is a specific source of ontological insecurity because it's a disordering presence that challenges US assumptions about the universal nature of its institutions and values. I think this is reflected in the American commentary on the rise of China, which emerged in the mid-1990s and focused heavily on the depiction of China as a threat. Yet many of the reasons for why China is seen as a threat in US discourse could also be applied to India, I'd like to suggest. India, like China, has witnessed a rise in nationalist sentiment in the past two decades. Like China, it has a conception of itself as a great and ancient civilization, and it has a perception of past colonial and imperial humiliation. 
India has embarked on major military modernization, it has nuclear weapons, and it has an expanding presence in the Indian Ocean. It's also had a tense relationship with the US in the past, uh, and their encounters in multilateral settings remains difficult. None of this, however, has generated significant commentary on an India threat. And this suggests that threat and danger aren't just objective conditions, but rather that they're the result of perception, interpretation and representation. I think what we see when we look at the overwhelmingly positive commentary on the rise of India is a representation of India that portrays it as affirming key tenets of, of uh, US identity, such as the universality of American ideas and institutions. So for instance, India's rise is said to be the result of its embrace of free market capitalism and its democracy is said to make it a benign power. Moreover, and more importantly, the assertions of India's moral neutralism, which was so prevalent during the Cold War, have been replaced with claims of India's responsibility and innate peacefulness, which endorse India's sense of civilizational exceptionalism. And you can see that in this quote from uh, Robert Kagan, the neoconservative commentator. Now, obviously, the end of the Cold War has something to do with all of this, but I think the enthusiasm for India in the United States also has to do with seeing it as a source of security against China and the general uncertainty caused by the transitioning of power. And this is not just in the military and political sense, but in an ontological sense. So in other words, I think the commentary on the rise of India by American commentators, officials and political leaders should be seen as an attempt to create a new special relationship with India. George W. Bush was one of the most enthusiastic proponents of a natural partnership with India, and Barack Obama recently described the US and India as indispensable partners, which is the same term he recently used for the US-UK relationship. And I don't think that that was a coincidence. He's someone who's very careful with his words. Both have advocated shared global leadership for the US and India, and both have made dramatic trust-building gestures toward India. For Bush, this was the US-India nuclear deal, and for Obama, US support for India's permanent membership of the Security Council. Now, we need to turn to the final question. Has the improvement in US-India relations been so great that we can say that India has experienced a revolution in how it sees itself? To answer this question, I'm going to ask two other questions. How is India's political leadership responding to the debate on India's rise to power in general and to American overtures in particular? And is there an Indian equivalent of China's response to the commentary on the rise of China, which was to claim that China is committed to a peaceful rise? So I'll start first with the National Democratic Alliance government. And that was the government in power when the commentary on the rise of India started emerging in the mid-2000s, mid and it was also when uh, the relationship with the US began to improve. The NDA, which was led by the Hindu Nationalist Party, the BJP, had, I think, a contradictory foreign policy, which was torn between two desires. One was a desire to implement a long-standing Hindu nationalist agenda for overhauling Indian foreign policy toward a more militaristic, confrontationist, less non-aligned path. Adopting this path would have ideally positioned India to accept and reciprocate American overtures while radically transforming its own worldview. The second desire, however, involved wanting to assert India's exceptionalism as a civilization that possesses unique qualities like restraint and resilience, for it's precisely these qualities that have come to lend originality and distinctiveness to India's biographical narrative. And significantly for the BJP in particular, this is what sets India apart from Pakistan. In the end, the NDA government responded to the debate on the rise of India by drawing on those older exceptionalist narratives and recasting them in the contemporary language of soft power. You can see that in this quote from, from Yashwant Sinha, um, foreign, former foreign minister, which is from a speech entitled, What It Takes to Be a World Power. So while India's relationship with the US certainly improved under the NDA, it didn't blossom into an alliance. In the current UPA government, uh, 
A number of leaders, like Sonia Gandhi, Kamal Nath, Shashi Tharoor, and Manmohan Singh have talked about their discomfort with the idea of India as a superpower and their desire for India to be a soft power, a knowledge power, is what uh, Manmohan Singh likes to call it. Singh has gone the furthest in elaborating the implications of soft power for India's contemporary foreign policy. He's argued, for instance, that because of India's history, culture, and civilization, its ultimate goal is to work for, for rule-based rather than power-based relationships and to support democratic values. This path, however, doesn't necessarily lead to a common agenda with the United States. India's gone much further, I think, in institutionalizing an ideational element to its relationships with the non-Western democracies of South Africa and Brazil, its partners in the IBSA Forum. And India, South Africa and Brazil have also been closely cooperating in the Security Council, in which all three are currently non-permanent members. And this suggests that IBSA is, current, is, is also turning into a political grouping. India's recent multilateralism has also involved institutionalising its relationships with China and Russia in the BRICS and the Basic Climate Change Coalition. Moreover, the one trust-building act that India has undertaken toward the US, its vote against Iran in the IAEA in 2005 and 2006, was somewhat diluted when it later opposed the imposition of a new sanctions regime against Iran and rebuffed a, a suggestion from the US State Department that it ask Iran to suspend uranium, uranium enrichment. So, to conclude, I think that these sorts of responses highlight that India is is recasting older ideas like non-alignment and self-reliance and parched shield into new forms such as strategic and economic autonomy, south-south cooperation and soft power. Its conception of itself and its role in the world has not been radically transformed and this doesn't bode well for any attempt by the United States to build a special relationship with India. I'm sure we have some questions or comments. It's impossible to see from here. <laughs> this one, yeah. Um, hi, my name is Papam Gandhok. Uh, I have a, what sounds like a couple of questions for Professor Lok Rai, but he may choose to take them as a comment depending on uh, <clears throat> how they come across. I was just wondering whether one interpretation of your topic, the unfinished revolutions, may well be a kind of karmic, incessant, constant circumambulation of just going round and round, <laughs> as perhaps being a more appropriate metaphor for those poor buggers who are just uh, are going round and round in circ or pursuit of a better life. Um, the second um, point, slightly more serious <coughs> and less tongue-in-cheek, was uh, is it possible that the uh, search for the English Coaching Academy stamp is perhaps merely symbolic of a deeper uh, underlying issue which is the lack, uh, the chronic shortage of um, uh, high quality training or providing people basic work skill readiness? And is it possible that that English stamp is just a mere symbol of that desperate need to be able to get some kind of vocationally, uh, vocationally acceptable training? And that that's really, as opposed to, uh, you know, merely a stamping of English, that that's really what's driving that behavior? <laughs> just to show you that Sikhs can be a bit more serious as well than just coming to <laughs> Okay, um, yeah, the, the karmic stuff obviously wasn't intended seriously. It would be deeply consoling if it were merely karmic. I suspect that it's actually located in history and might have historical consequences. But to come back to your, I, th I think your point is exactly right. English is merely, merely the, the symptom of a need. And it's, it's, it's basically in the way that one re reads what underlies it through reading symptoms that I intended to read English. So you're exactly right, you know, that it, it, it is. And it's there in the, there's something called the report of the National Commission for Enterprises in the Unorganized Sector, which actually looked at issues of employment. And uh, 
after once again doing the numbers that everything does, right? So the 18% of the labor force with middle level of education, 18% with secondary, adding up to 200 million, and then et cetera, et cetera. numbers. It, I quote, inadequate attention to this huge base of India's educational pyramid will not only further accentuate the existing unacceptably high levels of inequality, but might even lead to social tensions and conflicts. I suspect that that might is actually hopeful. Uh, well, I'm S.K. Jain from University of Delhi. Sir, uh, would you agree that the English has uh, created a great divide in the country like India between have and have nots? With the onset of the globalization, I think the the real benefit has been uh, grabbed by this, this urban middle class who has had access to the English language and for the reason of employment and all, and left the major chunk of the population of this country who are still looking after. There is a kind of simmering discontent, and I think that is where the revolution can come from. So I, I would say it has created a great divide, the language of English, even in the contemporary India. Would you agree to this? And secondly to Priya, that uh, with relation to India US relation, do you think the ro rule of the Republicans and Democratic, normally the Democratic Party rule has been considered to more closer to India, but the real clinch of the deal was with the Republican-led leadership of Bush. So do you see any role uh, of the Republicans and Democratic in the India US relation high and low? Thank you. I didn't follow the second question, no. but go ahead with the first <laughs> one. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Yeah, um, indeed, Jain, that exactly is what I was trying to argue. <laughs> that uh, that uh, uh, it is uh, English is both the language of access and inclusion and the language or instrument of exclusion, and you know, and the, and the problem derives precisely from this intimate paradox that the same thing, you know, sits. So in fact, I. I um, uh, was in conversation with uh, with uh, Gurcharan Das last year, uh, apropos English, and the and the title for what I wrote was um, English: the mixed curse, because it's not it's not a mixed blessing. My own reading of English is it's it's the it's a mixed curse. Obviously, it brings benefits, you know, and and the way in which I like to think about it is that you know it clearly clearly it brings benefits to individuals and. Heaven forfend that I should be the person who, who recommends standing in the way of individuals who seek betterment through English. Please, I don't wish to be misunderstood there, though I have been. But I'm not sure that this, these, that merely integrating these individual searches, seekings of betterment, add up to a collective solution. That. That the, that the collective solution is not merely the sum of individual solutions. So I suspect that, you know, rather like, you know, the metaphor I like is of people who are running a red light, that individuals can gain by running a red light, possibly, <laughs> but the collective loses. Because if everyone tries to run a red light, you get a jam, as you get in Delhi all the time. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think if you look back into history, you'll see that India has had champions among both Republicans and Democratic politicians in, in the United States. I don't think fundamentally there is a huge difference between the Republican foreign policy and, and Democratic foreign policy. Uh, they're both attached to this idea that the, the US is indispensable in, in the world. Um, so I think it would have been a little bit more difficult if there was a Democrat government in, in negotiations for the nuclear deal but I think you can see from the enthusiasm now that Obama supports it, that it wouldn't have been impossible. Nice. Um, uh, I would like to add up in this uh, pyramid. You talked about pyramid. So we, I have a thorough study of pyramid. In India, this education, higher education pyramid structure, we are fragmented pyramid now because most of the states have started in the education till 10 plus 2. And uh, this ILET and other things are joining the pyramid at different levels. 
and our orientation is more toward babudam not toward skilled labor which is the requirement of the day and government has taken a lot of initiative on that so we are giving soft skills english teaching this that but not caring for those skill labor required really for development so where employment exists so that is the you see scenario so we have to do revolution of just putting english cannot bring revolution in some places our local language local things can build skill and create em employment create positions for our labor so this is how we interpret the things thank you i don't know i'm in agreement yeah. i'm okay I'm, I'm, i'm in agreement entirely Good we're all in agreement so i think that uh, we'll call it today <laughs> and simply say what a fantastic job the two speakers <laughs> have done